morning and welcome to Newsmakers. The Central Labor Union of New York City organized the very first Labor Day parade and picnic on September the 5th, 1882. The custom spread and by 1894, the federal government declared the first Monday of September a national holiday. In 1998, where do the workers and the unions of Greater Cincinnati stand? To explore that issue, I sat down with two people. Dan Rafford, the president of the AFL-CIO Central Labor Council, and Lenny Wyatt, the president of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union. Here's a portion of that interview. You know, Dan, I think you were a guest last year, yeah. Labor Day weekend. Um, how would you evaluate this year, 1998? What's the big picture? What's the state of organized labor uh, in the greater Cincinnati area this year? I think in two areas. One, organizing. Uh, organizing is it's increasing. Uh, we have uh, a recent victory at, uh, with the Transit Union with Laidall that, that, that affected the whole community. Uh, uh, yesterday, uh, we started with the Carpenters. They put on 16 new organizers in one day. We have, have special organizing projects, and UFCW is a good example in, in what we have found in 98, the first time in 20 years, our decline in membership has stopped. More and more unions are increasing the resources in organizing. This. You talked about the um, upgrade in organizing. Why? What, what's, what's happening that you are finding the resources right now to do this newly energized organization? We perform a critical uh, study on ourselves, and we found that, that we cannot go forward with only 3% of our resources in organizing, and we are asking each local union to, to, to uh, uh, pledge to put 30% in organizing. Some puts more, but this is going further. Then we're going to the community. You, you, you know, we, we are we are next Sunday after Labor Day. We, we will be attending uh, services in all denominations where we have union members getting, getting a five minutes at, this, at the sermon in the churches, uh, the pulpit for labor, and explain to the community what it's all about. Because organizing is, is a community effort. Well, Lenny, one of the things about your union is that you are in the midst of a major organizational effort. Is that correct? First off, give us a little bit of a picture about the makeup, the size of um, uh, the, the retail uh, commercial workers, uh, food, food and commercial workers, I'm sorry. The United Food and Commercial Workers Union Local 1099 is uh, approximately 18,000 members and we have the jurisdiction, our area is southwest Ohio, northern Kentucky and four counties in southern Indiana. Uh, we're part of the UFCW International Union, has 1.4 million members throughout the United States and Canada. And uh, we primary focus our local is primary a retail, uh, food, uh, grocery stores, drug stores, uh, packing house companies. When you say supermarkets in this town, of course, the major one here, the classic, is Kroger's. What's the union's relationship? What's your local's relationship to Kroger's? Well, we have a, a, a good relationship, but uh, what builds that good relationship is our ability to um, organize or pressure the non-union competition. And, and that uh, builds the foundation from our perspective of where we're going to be at in the future. Um, we can't go to the bargaining table and request an employer to pay more money or in wages, benefits, pension, or health care if we don't bring the competition on board to, to equal the playing field. And uh, that's a pivotal message that we've explained to our membership. Either we're going to have to raise the non-union competition's wages up, or we're going to have to go downward. So Kroger's is organized. What else is organized locally in, the, in this area? The, our two principal um, uh, industries in our local is the retail grocery stores, and that's Kroger and Myers in Cincinnati. We do have Keller's IGA, and we have um, a lot of independent meat stores that are under contract as well. And then uh, Dayton, it's uh, Kroger, Meyer, and Cub Foods. And uh, we have uh, the drugstore industry as uh, CVS and uh, Rite Aid in Dayton. If 
uh, Meyer and Kroger's organize, does that mean Thriftway, uh, Biggs, some of these others are not? And are you actively trying to organize? Yes, we just uh, launched, uh, um, we have a, a program in our local union. It's, it's called Operation Competition. And it's a, um, a campaign that we uh, have started in uh, 1992. And it's an ongoing education program with our membership that, you know, you know how we're going to advance our contracts, and that is to organize or pressure the marketplace. And uh, so we're, they're all a target, you know, because they're, they interfere with our ability to improve our members' lives. You were saying that some of the, the picketing that we've seen in front of the big stores is informational, not so much an organizational effort. Um, what is it, you know, that you want people to do there, and, and how successful do you think that's been? We've been picketing on and off since 1993 in a, a various different formats, either informational picketing or um, consumer target to neighborhoods, um, direct mail. Uh, we've done uh, festivals, uh, you know, like this weekend we'll be at the Florence U All on Labor Day, and we'll be passing out, you know, where to shop union. Um, I think it's successful because the standpoint our um, employers, drug industry employers, and our food industry employers, since we've done our campaign, are healthier. Uh, their market share is up and it's increased. Operation competition, the model that Lenny's talking about for his union, is this a model that other unions in, in our area are working with at the same time? Currently the building trades uh, uh, unions are, are, are really uh, going out in, in, the same, in, in the same way to organize. You know, they are putting more and more pressure on their, uh, their union contractor to get a bigger share of the market. You know, one of the things with uh, the construction trades is the whole question. A lot of construction going on, particularly since I was very aware of it, you drive through Fort Washington Way, the riverfront. Um, how much of that work is going to be union work down there? Well, from from all indication, the Fort Washington Way, uh, you know, would be predominantly uh, a union, and and we think that's that's right because what union uh, work means is that the local workforce is working. You know, we think it's unfair for the on public projects, for uh, uh, the public to pay for for a, a construction project, and they will go outside the state and sometimes even outside the country to bring workers in and many times cheat on uh, benefits and things of that nature. Uh, the stadium, uh, we don't know at this point uh, because as you well know, uh, organized labor was pretty adamant that we did not feel that the, the less fortunate of this community should build two stadiums. So in other words, you were on the losing side of the political exactly. fight. Exactly, and uh, and we are still working on a uh, on a on a regular basis to put pressure to make sure that they fulfill the commitment to the minority community, which they said their jobs and and, and uh, in the county is is reneging on that, and that's just simply uh, not right. And and we went into an accord with the uh, black ministers of the city, indicating a goal of 20 percent in the building trades be minority or female. We're very proud of that. Uh, Dan, we've been in a period of tremendous economic growth over the last you know, six years for sure, maybe even a little bit longer than that. Um, what's that mean from a union's point of view? Is that good for union organizing or do people suddenly have so many choices that they don't have to pay attention to whether a place is organized or not? Well, economic growth is, is good for everyone, but it's not shared in this country or in this community because there's more and more that are forced to work two or three jobs just to keep their heads above water. And even with the economic growth, our buying power is less now than 20 years ago. We may have economic growth and we have made, made some progress in, in, the, in the social climate, social changes. But still, yeah, what we find our membership, they do not have the economic uh, confidence. And without both social changes, economic changes, you, you cannot have human dignity at the workforce. Labor Day not only is a celebration of labor, but it also kicks off the political season for all practical purposes. 
And a lot of people say, gee, Labor's traditional relationship with the Democratic Party isn't a true reflection of the membership. What do you say to that? Labor is not Democrat, Republican. It's not left politics or right politics. Really, labor, uh, you know, we view ourselves to in our responsibility to help those that are trying to bring themselves up because, as Looney indicated in, in their program, unless we bring the people up to a decent wage, not only here but offshore, you know, we cannot have uh, economic stability. Uh, we uh, in Cincinnati, uh, you know, we, we have supported 13% uh, uh, non Democrats. So, uh, you know, those that, that like that cliche to, to throw stones at us, they should come and, 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 and view the facts, and they know the facts. How many people in the area of Southwest Ohio that, that you're responsible for, how many people are union members? Right now we have in excess of 80,000 AFLCO union families. We call them union families because our responsibility does not stop at the work site. And I might add, too, Dan, there's, there's three voters to each union family. So we're talking about well over a quarter of a million voters in this area. Let me, you know, in your union, 18,000 members locally, a lot of people. Is elected politics, electoral politics, is this something that your members talk about in an organized sort of way? And if so, how? We have the responsibility, and, and as the leaders of local union, to to bring about issues that's going to affect them. Um, health care. Our industry is probably one of the largest industries in the country that doesn't provide health care to its workers. And again, that gets back to the organizing standpoint. We have health care, and it's our, our number one benefit. We, we, we guard it, and we, we save it. But we know it's, it's fragile because the employer down the street either doesn't provide it or it charges so much for the worker they don't have it. So it's a tremendous burden that's on the bargaining table. So. Yeah, we inform our membership what Congress is doing or lack of doing in the area of health care, providing access. Dan, we at the FLCO, we don't tell members how to vote. As Lenny indicated, we, we, we give them the candidates' records and, and we point out to them uh, uh, what's at stake and encourage them to vote. And we are very proud that 25% of the voters in the, in the last presidential election came from union families, 25%. So the system works. Dan, a question I think I asked you last year at this time, and I think we need to ask it again. From the perspective of the greater Cincinnati worker, uh, what's been the impact of NAFTA at this point? How do you see the impact of NAFTA? Well, you, you know, NAFTA, you know, has cost jobs. I, you, know, you know, I can show you. Uh, organized labor. Where, where, where would you say it's cost jobs locally? In, in, in manufacturing. Uh, in this area. ITT Pump uh, uh, recently uh, uh, is a good example, especially in the machine tooling, which is coming back. But, but labor is, is not opposed to, to the global economy. And uh, as you know, I work in Eastern Europe on a regular basis. What we are opposed to is the blatant, uh, you know, attempt of employers to go offshore to hire kids at, at, at 25, 50 cents a day, work workers without any type of safety, uh, uh, you know, equipment and pollute the environment. That's wrong. We want to be able to compete on, on, on a, a level playing field, and we can do that. You know, a study just recently just said a, a, a union company is 16 percent more more pro productive than a non-union country. But it's our responsibility to go bring these people up in, in these other countries to our standards, the same that it is Lenny's responsibility to go to the non-union retail establishment and bring these people up. We are different now than we were five years ago. I feel that it's my responsibility to represent all workers in this area, union and non-union, and, and, and we are doing that. Dan, final question. On Monday, um, big labor picnic. What will you be saying to people about the future of labor in 1998 as they look forward from this Labor Day? First, I would welcome everyone to the Labor Day picnic, which is the largest in the country, and you can come out and maybe even see Lenny White cook for his members on that particular day. Uh, 
We are a, a, a grassroots organization. We are going to continue to outreach to everyone, union and non-union, but our workers at the work site to get them involved, to educate them in issues. And what we have found, what we have found that when we go out and ask for participation, if it's in the church, if it's in the union hall, if it's at the plant, they respond. That's one of the key things on this Labor Day is that the, the rank and file member uh, is, is involved in their union and uh, the leadership is very much in tune and, and what Dan's done through the AFL-CIO here in Cincinnati, there's, it's more member activated and those type of programs with the membership being on were more successful. Stay tuned. After the break, we'll talk to a local historian who uses some very unusual resources to explore the history of the American labor movement. Welcome back. In the cushy days of the late 1990s, it's becoming more and more difficult to imagine what the men and women of the working class faced in the 1930s when they tried to organize themselves into unions. It meant, um, it meant warfare. Uh, indeed, it's, it's a very, very bloody period. Um, a number of strikes during the 1930s resulted in uh, uh, in loss of life, uh, in, in injury. The most dramatic and even the defining labor struggle in the 1930s occurred in Flint, Michigan in 1936 and 37, when UAW members seized the General Motors plants in Flint in a sit-in. The divisions in American society became painfully apparent. You're talking about workers going into the factory, taking control of a key plant and shutting down the operation and taking possession of the factory. Now, the owners weren't going to sit by and let that happen. They brought in the company police, or they attempted to bring in the company police, and here you have workers from, um, uh, from the gates and from, from various windows throwing uh, steel auto hinges at the company police as they attempt to, um, uh, to break, the, break into the gates and, and pull these workers out. When uh, the sheriff shows up in his car, workers that are in the streets overturn the car gasoline spilling one worker reaches for a match i mean we're talking about warfare in the streets that's and and, and yet workers understood that it was going to take that to earn um, uh, to get a higher wage to to get some control over their situation to get what the federal government was promising them historians have studied flint and other conflicts for years the traditional view focused on labor's new sense of determination why they may as well try to stop the sun from setting. They may as well try to drain the water from the lakes as to stop this great God-given, naturally inherent right of labor to organize everywhere in this country. And also on new labor leaders like John L. Lewis, the organizer of the upstart CIO. The workers of this country want representation. They want organization. They want participation. They want protection. They want employment. And they're going to have those things through the leadership and the instrumentality of this new labor movement. But over the last three decades, labor historians, like historians in every field, have shifted their focus and broadened the resources they employ. In labor history, what that means is instead of viewing, um, let's say, a strike, a clash between uh, workers and management from the perspective of what do the union leaders want and what does the leaders of management say they're willing to give and focus on the kind of back and forth negotiations that goes on. Um, Historians now are, are spending more time looking at what was in the minds of average workers to, to get a, an appreciation of, of how they felt and what they were thinking as these events unfold. Now the sources that I've paid considerable attention to is labor songs because in these songs what they're doing is writing in their fears, their thoughts, their apprehensions, their hopes, their dreams. They're coming from workers themselves. They're, um, 
they're being sung by workers. And not only are the lyrics um, providing a kind of insight into workers who otherwise didn't leave any written sources, the, the very materials that historians normally um, uh, examine, um, not only do the lyrics themselves provide an insight into these workers, but singing itself as a process for these workers, I think, needs to be understood more clearly, that, that it brought workers together. It energized them. Um, those individuals, and in my instance, workers, to uh, flex their, their psychic muscles, so to speak. It allows them to um, uh, exercise some control over a situation that often they felt they had no control. Even more importantly, Lynch argues that who wrote the songs makes all the difference. Another thing that I found by looking at the lyrics is not only that not only that the workers were decidedly class conscious, but that women and men often articulated what I'll call their claim to justice in different ways. That men often in their songs um, would describe the struggle to unionize as, um, as, as championing brotherhood among workers, solidarity, um, almost a kind of male togetherness. Music written by women, on the other hand, like The Mill Mother's Lament by Ella Mae Wiggins, reflects another set of values. Strikers, or in other strikes, as allies to their husbands, brothers, sons, etc., um, they often articulate what um, the strike is all about, what the struggle is all about, in terms of what it means to the family, in terms of what it means putting bread on the table, uh, providing security for their um, uh, for the home, uh, providing for their children, um, so that their children don't have to live the lives that they did. It is for our little children. What you're hearing, um, first of all, is not Ella Mae Wiggins. Um, she was shot during the strike. Um, and her fellow workers thought because she wrote these songs, because she, she had this, um, uh, this way of turning a phrase and um, providing a kind of potent propaganda for workers in their struggle. Um, so what you're not hearing is, is her voice, and indeed, A Mill Mother's Lament, sung by a, a male vocalist, loses something in the delivery. And what led Lynch to this interest in labor history? It's more than academic curiosity. Even before I was, I mean, even when I was a, a small child, I can remember that one of the few topics that would raise my father's dandruff, that would really upset him, was when someone talked down unions, when they said that they were outmoded, they weren't necessary. He was, uh, when he, he was a union carpenter all his life. He's going to be 91 this year. And um, he understood that being part of a union allowed him to be, uh, allowed him to provide for his family. He understood that it gave him some protection on the job. He understood that uh, labor unions had their place. Samuel Gompers, the great labor leader and founder of the American Federation of Labor, loved to point out what he thought was the difference between Labor Day and almost all other national holidays. Gompers said, all other holidays are connected with the conflicts and battle of man's prowess over man, of strife and discord for greed and power, of glories achieved by one nation over another. Labor Day is devoted to no man, living or dead, to no sect, to no race or nation. The murals here in the Union Terminal celebrate the workers of the 1930s. Thanks for joining us this Sunday on Newsmakers, and enjoy the rest of your Labor Day weekend.